we're going to have some fun with the two witnesses now. Okay. The two witnesses. Okay. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days, which is how long? Three years. Three years. <laughs> Clothed in sackcloth. So the question now comes, and there's debate over this, who are the two witnesses? I've heard all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. One of the things I heard, really, to me, the most absurd thing I heard is that the two witnesses are the Old and New Covenants. The Old and New Testament are the two witnesses. Yeah. You know, if you're one of those in one of those groups that likes to symbolize everything away, because you can't explain what's going on here with Revelation, and Revelation's all symbolic, you got to do something with the two witnesses, so you kind of pull that out of your hat. So that's one of the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they were the two that appeared on Mount Transfiguration. That's another, what I prefer, yeah. Yeah, another is Elijah and Enoch, because those are the only two men that didn't die. They were both. Yeah, I heard that too. God. Well, that would be neat to pick you up and think, oh, yeah, I'm going to go yeah. back and die. I'm going to go back and die. Well, here's the Everybody's thing. Gotta die. Everybody's going to die. Everybody's going to die. But everybody doesn't. We'll all be changed. We won't all sleep. That's right. Here's the thing with Enoch, though. The problem is, is this is a Jewish thing. This is an Israeli thing, okay? Israel was not a thing during the time of Enoch. It's all pre-flood. Enoch was pre-flood. So Abraham wasn't even around yet. And now we are, can we not have, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and you've got to have Jacob. And then you got to have the nation Israel. We didn't have any Mosaic law, no nothing. So we had nothing back in Enoch. But I think Moses and Elijah is the most logical. And so we'll get into some of that. Let's take it. Why don't we take a look at the transfiguration real quick? Let's look at the one in Matthew 17. Let's go there. It's also in Mark 9. So you know. Um, yeah, we'll look at like the first 11 verses here. Matthew 17. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured, he, meaning Jesus, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Again, I'm not real sure how they knew who it was, unless the Lord just kind of told them, or maybe they were wearing party name tags. Hello, my name is Moses. Hello, my name is Elijah. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Moses. You killed my prophets. Prepare to die. Hey, <laughs> yeah, Could have been the Holy Spirit did it. Yeah. Okay, so, verse 4, Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. That's early New Testament speak for this is cool. <laughs> if you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. There's Peter again trying to help out and come up with a really cool plan. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. In other words, shut up, Peter. <laughs> Listen, hear him. Verse 6, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. It's different from what we get with some of the so-called prophecy visions that people have today where you don't hear about them falling down on their face like this instead it's I was hanging out with my baby Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was shaving in the mirror and Jesus showed up over my shoulder and we just palled around all day. No, it's not like that. No, they were greatly afraid, which you would be if the glory of the Lord is there and you hear this big booming voice of thunder from heaven, right? But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. 
when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now, as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. He's trying to get across them that I, I've told you before, and I keep trying to tell you guys I've got to die. Because they, remember, they don't have this two, the split visit kind of thing from the Messiah. They just see the one visit. He's coming and he's going to conquer, and we get to enjoy that and be involved in that. They, so um, he's trying to impress this on them. So his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So just as we have near and far fulfillments of prophecy and types um, so frequently, Jesus is trying to communicate to them that, that John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. And we'll address that some more because um, some people, particularly I think of the amillennial type view, might try to say that John the Baptist was Elijah and he fulfills that prophecy here. We'll get into that a little bit more and, and how that's not the case, that this is just kind of one of those um, near and far fulfillment kind of things that happens. And I can back it up with scripture and so we will. So, yeah, they actually, in First John, they asked um, if John the Baptist, he was, yeah, he says, uh, he says, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, um, what, are you Elijah? And he says he's not. John 1. Yeah. Yeah, what did I say? First John. Oh, sorry. Got it. That's all right. And then he, they asked him if he was a prophet. And he says, no, I'm not, I'm not any of that. And then um, I think also we have, and well, we'll get there. But Jesus also said the same thing. Well, Jesus said so, in Matthew 11, 14, he says, if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. In that prefiguring, but then uh, in another place he says he's not, that he is to come, that he's still to come. So we'll, we'll get there. Well, he, yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> One thing at a time. You guys are getting ahead of me. You guys are good. Well, this is good. So I'm glad you guys have your thinking caps on. So let's let's unpack this a little bit. So in uh, Zechariah 4 through 13, it says, uh, Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Um, so he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. So here in Zechariah, they're looking at two witnesses in that passage there um, that are uh, in heaven. But then what we've got in Revelation chapter 11 is we've got two witnesses on the earth. So what was that Zechariah? Ze Zechariah 4, 13. You actually can read that whole passage leading up to that, starting with verse 1. So... This whole thing that we get to with the oil and the lamps and all that. Remember, the oil is symbolic usually in the scripture for what? The Holy Spirit. And so the way that works, too, is, is that they would get oil from the um, olive trees, and they had a system where they would come through these thin pipes and drip down in the lamps, and the lamps would never run out, and they would always burn because there was always a flow of oil going into the lamps. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So here, though, in the vision, it was this lamp, and there were two oak trees, or olive trees, oak trees, olive trees on either side of them. I can advance this. So because it says um, in Revelation chapter 11, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that are before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, 
This is how he is doomed to be killed. Probably not a fun way to die. So the two witnesses are going to be on the earth. It sounds like armies and whoever else will attack them regularly and people will be trying to kill them, but then they will be doomed. Let's, let's look at the possibility of Elijah here, okay? Um, the case for Elijah. Um, so not only were Elijah and Moses seen at the Mount of Transfiguration, as, as you folks noted and, and uh, pointed out, um, look in your, if you're still there in Matthew, you can flip back a couple pages and go to Malachi. It's the very last book of the Old Testament. Look at chapter 4. Mal Malachi. 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 <laughs> That's right. He's the first Italian prophet. Let's see what's <laughs> Didn't that, wasn't that a movie, The Malachi Papers? <laughs> so here we have The Malachi Paper. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at this here. The great day of the Lord, the great day of God. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great day, great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Well, one of the things I wanted to point out was he says, um, I will send you Elijah the prophet, but notice before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Notice it's not during. So if the two witnesses start, they have their beginning in ministry in the beginning or in the middle of the tribulation and they go all the way to the end, they're not coming before the great and terrible, the dreadful day of the Lord. They'd be during. This passage set here, the Lord says, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So now you might ask, well, why would, why is this here in this passage then? Well, again, I think it's just the Holy Spirit, John and their inspiration of the Holy Spirit is setting the stage for some of the players because what we're getting ready to have in the next chapter is we're going to have some interaction between Satan, Antichrist, uh, the two witnesses, in the temple by the time especially you get to chapter 13 so this is setting up some of the players and the location so that's why this is here is, is it's one of those again meanwhile back at the ranch what we say about parenthetical where it's you've got to say okay now i haven't told you about the two witnesses yet um let me tell you about these guys and i'll tell you why and so he's telling us about the two witnesses Besides, it's an awesome thing we need to know about anyway, right? But uh, it's it's very cool. But that's why they're here. And uh, could John have said something about them sooner? Could he have said something back in Revelation 6, maybe, when he's talking about the seals, opening the seals, and talking about, you know, the two witnesses when they come along? He could have, I guess. He could have gotten there. But that could be kind of confusing because 
really when he kicks off the seals in Revelation chapter 6, he's, he's talking about the four horsemen of the apocalypse and that kind of thing. So that might get all kind of muddied up. And really where the, the focus for the two witnesses, where we see some out, outstanding uh, action is in the middle of the tribulation week. So the flashback makes a lot of sense. So you know, it works, works for me, works for me dealing with like, uh, you know, writing scripts and movies and so forth. That's a cool way to do it is to kind of flash back, you know, three and a half years earlier. So because they're going to be witnessing for three and a half years, do you think they're going to be starting right at the beginning of the 70th one? In my opinion, I think so. I think, I think it, it could be, I've heard a couple of people express before that um, they, if they're not the ones who, bring the 144,000 to Christ, to the true Messiah. That wake-up call that happens when the rapture happens and a few people wake up, be there maybe to offer them guidance and to send them on the mission, maybe to pray over them or to get the seals on their foreheads and all that. However that happens, I'm not real sure. But I think it's a good possibility that there's that connection there because it's a Jewish thing. And now since Revelation 6, it's a Jewish book that the two witnesses are there to attest and witness concerning the true Messiah, and then you end up with 12,000 from each of the tribes of Israel, and so forth, and the ministry goes on. Well, and also, too, it, you know, uh, in the Old Testament, which is, like you said, we're back to, church has been taken out, we're back to dispensation of the Old, you know, the old Testament. Mm -hmm. So, always in the Old Testament, God always sent a prophet first. I mean, he was as good as, as, a good as he could be. And so there was always, like, you know, Jeremiah, hey, just give up and go. This is his judgment. You're, you know, don't um, and so, yes, a witness to Christ, but also forewarning. Of, a forewarning. Um, mm -hmm. So this very much goes along with the Old Testament pattern that God had done back then. Yeah. Well, then that's true. And it could even be that um, uh, the, these events are offset by a handful of days where the two witnesses were there right before the seals were open. And they well, ended up, you know... Mm -hmm. and being beforehand that, hey, this is coming, you know, that mm -hmm. very much goes to speak. Makes sense that it be two witnesses or two, you know. Yeah. So is the day of the Lord referring to the second half of the tribulation? Primarily, that's where things ramp up. And, and we get that mostly from, like again, at Matthew 24. Um, okay, now we're going to flip forward again. Um, Joel. Uh, Matthew, but, but look at Matthew 24. Joel, all kinds of places like that, and they describe those events. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few places in in um, Matthew 24 where Jesus talks about those events, but particularly, um, like at verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that was in chapter 9, right? Standing in the holy place, and again, that's Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to anything. So this is, this is uh, the great and terrible day of the Lord where you've got, to, you've got to run and get out of there. Look at verse 21. For Then there will be great tribulation such as, not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. In other words, this is it. This is as bad as it gets. Now, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, please, I've said this again, that doesn't mean God's going to make days like 20-hour days or 10-hour days. And so. The days are shortened by the second coming. In other words, if time were allowed to progress, we wouldn't be here very long. We, we have a three and a half year period. And, and so you wonder why we have a restrainer, the Holy Spirit restraining evil in the world and restraining Satan himself. When the restrainer lets go, as we see, as Paul wrote as well, you see how quickly things wrap up. So even without God dumping wrath on the earth, look how quickly things escalate and get ugly. So we probably wouldn't even make it to redemption if... When did it start happening? You know, uh, Genesis chapter 3, after the fall, Genesis 3.15. When did the Holy Spirit start restraining evil? 
I mean, un, I mean, restrained evil was pretty bad. Um, the flood was pretty bad. Sodom and Gomorrah pretty bad, and lots of stuff in between, really bad. But that's restrained. So we would have not seen the plan of redemption even make it to the cross in that amount of time if the restrainer wasn't restraining. This is a period here where things happen so quick. So in the, we have add to that um, God's wrath poured upon the earth and all his, his curses, the, the three woes and so forth. You know, it, it wraps up in three and a half years. And if not, according to Jesus here, nobody would be saved. I mean, it'd be, everybody would be dead. There'd be nobody to go into the millennium because there'd be no flesh saved. So it's going to be, it's going to be an awful time. So, yeah, so that is the, I mean, it's all tribulation. It's all bad. But Jesus pointed out, and it was significant that he pointed out the great tribulation where things really wrap up and get, get ugly. Now, so let's look at, let's go from there now about, um, about John the Baptist. As I, I think we need to, we need to sell that a little bit more too, because you guys have already, let's, let's run over these verses that some of you folks have already brought up. So, um, um, we can, here's one we didn't look at yet. Nobody mentioned, right? Luke one. Luke 1, let's look at verses 13 to 17. Um, that didn't Luke write. I was in Luke chapter 2. Yeah, chapter 1. That Luke's better. I'm going to keep going until you guys laugh. Okay, verse 13, Luke chapter 1. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go up before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. So he was of Elijah. He's in the spirit and power of Elijah um, to turn the hearts and fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom and just. So unless you believe in, unless you believe in uh, reincarnation anyway, Paul or uh, John the Baptist was not Elijah. So he was in the spirit and power of Elijah because he had the Holy Spirit. Remember, when did the Holy Spirit start? indwelling people and coming with power and so forth. Pentecost, yeah, Acts chapter 2. So this was an unusual kind of so thing. Okay, so here, until, okay, we're going to roll um, So we have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The New Covenant isn't until they, I mean, we're not, they're not done and we're not bracketed until there's the refusal of when he walks in on the, donkey and they refuse him at that point it moves forward. that that's when you so get, still, according to daniel's 70th week that's when you get the 69th week he's cut when messiah is cut off yeah so it's cut off. up until this point we're still in the old covenant dispensation the old, yeah so in the same way that they were not indwelt and the holy spirit would come upon people like david this is what's happening and it, a lot of times it was temporary like samson yeah. Sam, uh, Samson would be like clothed. I think when you get into the Hebrew, it's like he's clothed sometimes with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and then he came upon David at one point and never left. And that's so. So you're saying the same spirit? We're going to call it the Holy Spirit, but it's the same spirit as Elijah with the same purpose. Well, yeah, the Holy Spirit, yeah. exactly, but okay. in a different, different, different type of a way. I just want to make but, sure we're understanding. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's good questions. That's exactly right. Um, let's let's look at. Let's look at, uh, here's a cool one, 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to make you all flip some pages tonight. But these are important verses. I think it's important that we get this, that we get this right and we understand it correctly. Um, this is such an awesome chapter anyway. One of my favorite chapters was Elisha, you know, where all the 
kids are making fun of Elisha's bald head. And no, anyway. Um, <laughs> you know. Um, okay, so Second Kings chapter two. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please. The Lord has sent me to, on to Bethel, or Bethel, depending on who you are. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now, the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So the prophets were in on this, right? Maybe that's part of what makes them prophets. And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Shut up. He says, I'm having a bad day. I don't want to see my friend go. So he says, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please. The Lord has sent me on to Jericho. Oive, as they say. Okay, now we're going from Bethel to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who are Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Shut your mouth. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jordan. So by this time, Elijah, Elisha's probably thinking, how did I know you were going to say something like that? But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now, Elijah took his mantle rolled it up, and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that. So it's like a parting of the Jordan River, right? So that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So it wasn't like he splashed it so hard with the water and then it's, okay, quick. No, it was dry ground. It was just something miraculous. And so it was when they crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Interesting, isn't it? So he said, well, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be for you. In other words, if, if you get to see everything take place, that's a yes from God. Okay, otherwise if I just vanish and disappear, that's probably a no. But, um, if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Well, that would be kind of cool. Verse 12, and Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes, and tore them in two pieces. He also looked up. The mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him went back and stood on the bank of Jordan. And when he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and he struck the water and he said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Then when he had also struck the water, it was divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. So that is the spirit of Elijah um, coming upon John the Baptist. It's not like it's a reincarnation or John the Baptist is Elijah, but it's, he's a, a type. And that's, that's what to confirm. That's unlike Malachi where it says Elijah will come before. So it's not just the spirit and power of Elijah, but it's Elijah's coming. So that's kind of the difference here. Now, um, to confirm, we looked at Matthew 17. We saw what was there, verses um, 10 to 13 at the Transfiguration. And uh, 
He said, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Verse 10, and the disciples said, saying, uh, asked him, saying, why then do the scribes say that Elisha must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming. Future tense. John the Baptist is dead here. So Jesus isn't talking about, he's not saying that John the Baptist is Elijah. He says he is coming. Um, he's coming first and will, future tense, restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, etc. So he went in to explain so they understand that how the uh, typology and how the prophecies is the near and, and far for future fulfillment. So we see future here, um, which we you know we covered some of that before when we were talking about Jesus talked about the abomination of desolation, and we already saw that Antiochus was 200 years before Jesus, but Jesus is saying, hey, when you see him come. So we, this is a pattern that we see happen all the time. Yes. I have a, a before question. A before? So the fact that we're talking about the spirit, and how did it say the spirit of, the same spirit as Elijah had will, will be on. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the spirit being on Elisha and... Elisha and John the Baptist. The same kind of thing. So the same spirit that Elisha had from Elijah, John the Baptist got. Yeah. I'm trying to say if that would be kind of a confirmation that there won't be any indwelling of the spirit in the spirit of Elijah and John the Baptist. No, not really. And wait, that's that's a hard one. I've gone around and around with that, and I can argue with myself on every side of that argument. I know it's not church, but the the redemption is done on the cross already. So I know that the new the tribulation the way, saints aren't church, if but he's going all the way to do a temple to point back, then won't there be a? Well, because they're not pointing future where it must yet happen. It's already done, so they're, they're looking back. So I don't know. Like I said, I can argue both sides of that like all night long and then I do that right now. But maybe we'll talk about it some more. And if you find a verse that confirms one way or another, then let me know. I'm talking that. about the tribulation, not once we get to the millennium. Oh, he's yeah, all right. He's millennium is, that's yeah, it's going to be, that's a whole that's entirely different. different animal, isn't it? Yeah. Whole other kettle of fish. So, so the disciples are still grappling with the the duality of the, the Messiah coming in two different visits okay. and stuff. So that's really tough. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so Saying the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. It's not Elijah's spirit. Okay. <laughs> it was Elijah's okay. spirit, you know, going, yeah. That's almost kind of a, a halfway form of of uh, reincarnation, right? Spirit babies going on and going, spirits going and leaving from one person and going and living <laughs> in somebody else. It's like, well, that'd be horrific, wouldn't it? Uh, I don't know what it said. Reincarnation would be a cruel joke. <laughs> Reincarnation <laughs> would be cruel. Oh, it would be. Horrible. Okay. Can I do this again? <laughs> exactly. Go back and tell you get it right. Exactly. Oh. So now let's look at some. This is another thing about Elijah, okay? Um, this is speaking of the two witnesses. We're back in Revelation chapter 11 now. Let's move forward. And um, it says they have the power to shut the sky that. No rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Elijah, <laughs> Elijah did do that. Elijah did do that. So, in fact, it, it makes me question whether or not it's possible that when the two witnesses come upon the earth and we've got the seals and all this going on and all the fires and things getting scorched, at least for the first three and a half years, maybe there isn't going to be any rain. I, I don't recall anything in the scripture that says, we do know that there's going to be drought and disease, this kind of a thing. And so, drought and famine and pestilence. but they have the power to do this. And that was very much an Elijah thing. Uh, King said that um, Elijah stopped, stopped the rain for three years and six months. And uh, James 5, 17 also records it. Hmm? Three and a half years again? Uh, three and a half years <laughs> again. Jesus there's a thing with three and a half years coming up. 
Also, Luke 4.25, Jesus spoke of that event, the same event in family in the land, talking about it in three years and six months. Isn't that interesting? I think he's trying to send us some kind of a message. Do you remember this image, that movie? Okay. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood. And that, I know, the that's a really strong hint. I kind of dropped there with the, with the photo, you know. No, Charlton Heston, not Moses. Uh, the power to turn the waters, power of the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So, again, this, it points to Moses and Elijah, it seems to, very strongly. I mean, the plagues are notably the same as with Moses. So, now here, here's an interesting thing, because you say, well, well Moses died, and, and it, you know, that's kind of what we're told. Moses went up, and went into was, um, Moab on the mountain, and he died. Um, this is a bit of speculation. If you find any more research, let me know, but mm, there's speculation vis-a-vis -vis the disposition of the body of Moses, okay? In Deuteronomy, his body was, as far as the writer adding the addendum knew, was left on a mountain in Moab, but no one knew where it was left. So Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books, but then we've got this little add-on thing. Obviously, Moses didn't write it after he died. I mean, he could have presciently written it down before it happened because the Lord told him this is what's going to happen, so write this down, Moses. He could have done that. Um, and, you know, it, but I don't, we just don't know, okay? But what I want you to look at real quick, just as a bit of fun, Jude, yes, Jude 7 to 9. Flip to Jude. Hey, Jude, I know somebody was going to go there. Don't be afraid. All right. So this is a really an enigmatic, strange kind of a passage. Okay. Um, we'll start with verse 7 because we can open another can of worms if we go earlier. And we'll open that can of worms sometimes, I'm sure. But anyway. Um, God's judgment on the great day. The judgment of the great day is the context as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, flesh, set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Verse 8, likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So this kind of jammed in here in the middle is Michael the archangel and uh, the devil, whether it's before the throne of God or whatever's going on, there's some fight, this big argument over the body of Moses. What's that about? Well, that's where the speculation begins. And probably this might be where the speculation should end. But the body of Moses probably should have stayed in the ground like the rest of the Old Testament saints, right? So Michael had the body and was bringing it up and taking it into heaven. Maybe the devil's going, hey, whoa, whoa, what is up with that? What's going on there? You know, there could be an argument like that because why was Moses' body being treated differently? Well, you know, there's speculation that this could be part of the reason why is that God is, wasn't done with Moses yet and wanted him to have the same body and whatever else. And God could have done what he did with, you know, what he'll do with the saints um, at tribulation. The dead in Christ will rise first and bring their bodies up to meet their spirits in heaven, right? But there's something about he didn't want Moses or the devil to get a hold of Moses' body for whatever reason. Did Moses know what God's plan was? Or did, did the devil know what, Moses, what God's plan was for Moses? Let me say that again to get my, my tongue wrapped around my eye teeth so I can't see what I'm saying. So did the devil know what God's plan for Moses was for this? The Mount of Transfiguration, for instance, um, you knew at least by then, but Deuteronomy was way, way, way before that, right? So 
Um, it's interesting. So your guess is as good as mine. So this is an answer to the kind of a question about, well, wait a minute, uh, Elijah um, didn't die and he just got taken up into heaven. And that was the same type of question about Enoch, right? Well, Enoch was, was and then he was not, for the Lord took him. Um, but then we got Moses and we've got this dispute over his body. So there's some interesting things going on. So in a way, we have the Mount of Transfiguration and it's, it's very telling. But um, don't know, folks. I mean, you tell me. Well, not I read about uh, Moses and Elijah at the Mount of Transfiguration was that they basically represented the law and the prophets. Yes. Moses, the law, Elijah represented the prophets. Right. And thank you for pointing that out because I'm getting carried away in some of the minutiae of the details. <laughs> but yeah, clearly that's the case. And that's, they've always, and the Jews understood this. Now you're speaking Jewish language. You're speaking what the, what the Jews knew. And that was what they always meant to the Jewish people um, looking at those two. This, uh, the law of Moses, right? They didn't even call it the Ten Commandments. They didn't always even call it the commandments of the Lord. They called it the law of Moses very often. So, all right, so any more questions about that right now? We're going to wait. Confusing, confounding. Some, some of that stuff, like Jude, you just can't take it any further because it's not, unless you find some. If you do, please let the class know. Inquiring minds want to know. But it's interesting. All right, so continuing into um, the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, this is where this is where things are only just starting to get interesting, in my opinion, just starting. And we'll have another timeline pin to stick in this. And I'm I'm hoping you guys will already recognize it as soon as we get there, but coffee break. Okay, so verse seven. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. That symbolically, see, there is symbolism in Revelation. And guess what? It just told it, told us it was symbolism, right? Hmm. So the great city symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. That told us the meaning. It's talking about Jerusalem, right? But it's a really evil and wicked Jerusalem, such as it is even now, okay? I can't imagine how evil and wicked it's going to be with the restrainer gone, but it's pretty bad now. Verse 9, for three and a half days, there's three and a half again. Good grief. For three and a half days, some from the uh, peoples and the tribes and the languages and nations will gaze at their bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. Now, let's take this. Let's assume that the two witnesses were at the second half during the um, great and terrible day of the Lord, not before, but during. And so they're there during the great tribulation. And that's when their ministry is the second half. And they've just been slaughtered at the very end of the tribulation. Do you see anything wrong with this picture? Part of that, um, Three and a half days, pretty much the whole world, peoples, tribes, languages, nations, are going to be gazing at their dead bodies. So that presupposes, even from the proponents that the two witnesses were during the second half, they're all going to be on cell phones and on the internet looking at their bodies. Do you think there's going to be cell technology really working and the internet and satellite stuff working at the end of the tribulation? Because here's what we get at. Let's look at this here. Um, okay, aside from the seals, we have the trumpets. 
just I mean, during the, the trumpets alone, leading up to this point, we've had great hail storm um, that destroy a third of the trees and green grass. Um, that's in Revelation 8, 7. Asteroids strikes the sea, destroys a third of the sea creatures and the ships. That's in Revelation 8, 8. A third of the fresh water becomes undrinkable, Revelation 8, 11. Fire, volcanic smoke, and brimstone are showered on the people in Revelation 9, 17 to 18. Oh, and not to mention the demonic, demonic uh, beasties, scorpion-looking grasshopper things running around, locusts stinging people, and um, the big horse horde, demonic horde that's going to be killing people on the earth. Um, so that's bad enough leading up to the, up to the middle of the week. But then, okay, by the time we're done with the um, middle of the week here, the, the kickoff of the Great Tribulation, um, by the time you're done with the bowls and assuming that the, the two witnesses are at the end of all this and, and we've got this celebration and the partying and they're exchanging presents and making merry like it says here, um, that would be they're making merry and having all this fun and partying and everything after another great earthquake has destroyed a tenth of Jerusalem and kills 7,000, what happens in verse 13, an infectious disease that causes sores on the body, strikes both men and animals worldwide in chapter 16. Those people are going to be in a party mood. Um, the sea becomes foul so that all sea creatures die. Remember the, one of the bowls is that all the water turns to blood. The remaining fresh water becomes fouled as well. The sun's heat is intensified and scorches the earth. Um, the world gathers for the final battle of Armageddon. Those are all in chapter 16. Another mega earthquake rocks cities around the world in 1618. So the list is incomplete, but you know, you've had 2 billion people die by the time you're done with the trumpet judgments. And then another, how many times you've got 130 pound hail again that falls. The entire planet is decimated by the second coming. Uh, so to me, logically, that's not those who dwell on the earth will rejoice and make merry and exchange presents. I don't see that. People with all these spoils and sores and stuff like that. So that's another reason, another thing to stick a pin and say, now their ministry is the first half. And, and then when we get also into chapter 12, when it introduces the Antichrist beast comes out of the sea and everything that happens, how he goes after the two witnesses. And then he goes after Israel. They flee to um, Petra, but he sends a flood after them of armies or so forth. And all these things start happening. And then he goes in the temple, stops. So all uh, all these things that happen around the temple um, start happening in, in chapter 12 and 13 and so forth. So... These events that all happen right now, it, it just makes more sense that, um, <coughs> excuse me, who, what John's doing is he's setting up um, what it looks like when we get to the introduction of the Antichrist beast in the next chapter, okay? So here what we've got is um, the beast has come out of the bottomless pit and the attacks and now beast now i don't know if you remember this chart for uh, on online reasons and so forth so the beast now who is the beast remember the the beast is what we're calling the antichrist beast in this passage here okay and that's different from the false prophet and it's different from satan so satan's the black text serpent um devil satan the deceiver okay and then we've got um, the Antichrist beast. So this is Antichrist possessed by Satan after he's slaughtered. Let me just read through this again real quick. So the beast, Antichrist, that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. We just read that, okay? And that's post the Antichrist's resurrection, which I believe is by permission of God or by the activity of God. This, this is part of God's wrath that he does. God is doing this now, okay? And so you've got the second point, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, uh, the deceiver in chapter 12, verse 9. 
Okay, but it mentions again, the third point, and I saw the beast rising up out of the sea. Now, at one point it says he's coming up out of the bottomless pit. That's where he originates, right? Rising up out of the sea, probably the sea of people, which means, um, you know, all the nations of the earth refers to large numbers of people with ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems on his horns, and blasphemous names on uh, its head. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. And we'll see that in chapter 13. So the beast is one entity. All the power comes from Satan. Okay, he gives it all his power and his authority. Then I saw another beast, and we'll get into that um, after this. And that's going to be um, the false prophet. And he speaks like a dragon. And he has all the uh, exercises the authority of the first beast and causes the inhabitants to worship the, the first beast. And that was point number four. And that's in chapter 13. And uh, um, point number five, another example. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast um, that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. So the scarlet beast is the same one as the seven heads and ten horns we saw before. Before, So the scarlet beast, the beast, it's, it's the same thing, the same entity. Um, but it's named differently in chapter um, 17 as scarlet beast. Um, and number six, and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit. And that's in Revelation chapter 20. So I just wanted to go by that by way of review just to show the who's who. So when we talk about the beast that came after the two witnesses, we know that that is going to be possessed Antichrist, empowered by um, Satan to go and do this. Okay, so back to Revelation chapter 11 now, verse 11. So, but after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God enters them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the quake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Um, I have one particular theory about this because that great earthquake falling in Jerusalem and 7,000 killed and so forth. And my, I kind of, you know, I was looking at it and reading again in Zechariah, Zechariah 13 and so forth and reading Revelation 12. Satan sending a, a great flood after um, the woman, the woman being Israel, right? And we'll get there in chapter 12, but the woman Israel. My thought is that when he comes up and he slays um, the two witnesses, that that's the big clue to those who are believers in Jerusalem to get out of, jo get out of Dodge. So three and a half days, they're migrating toward Jordan. Like, let, let's, let's get out of this place. This is not a good thing here. So they're getting out. So that when the time this earthquake happens, remember God tends to evacuate his people before he does something. We saw that with the flood, as in the days of Noah, and as in the days of Lot. Um, even if there was 10 people who was a believer, God was not going to rain fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's kind of my idea. Um, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it seems reasonably God can do whatever he wants. But One thing real quick. It seems to me, if, actually, if you look at the very next verse in Revelation 11, um, after the earthquake, Revelation 11, 14 says, the second woe has passed. Right. Behold, the third woe is coming. It's, so it kind of, I'm getting the vibe that if this stuff is not the first three and a half years, nor the last three and a half years, but three and a half years somewhere in the middle. I mean, not necessarily, it could be just, Slightly offset from the beginning, but I mean, if this the if this is the second woe, then we've you know, 
all the stuff that we've gone through already in the first one. The first wall was in chapter nine with the locust-like beasties and the horse-like horde. The second is um, Satan cast down to earth and the arrival of the Antichrist. Now, see, we fall, we see Satan falling down to earth, which has got to happen before chapter 11, before he comes up out of the pit or before he comes out of the sea to go after. Um, Satan's got to get cast down to earth. Well, we find out John gives us the narrative how that happens when he does like a, not a flashback, but a flash up. His perspective changes to heaven now. There's a war in heaven. And Michael steps up and kicks Satan down. So we've got the second woe is Satan cast down to earth and the arrival of the Antichrist beast by Satan. Okay, so this, this wraps it up, though, when we get into to this. And then we'll continue on. Or we can also discuss more um, afterward. But the seventh trumpet. Now the seventh seal was opened up and we, it gave us the seven trumpets, right? The seventh trumpet heralds the, um, the bowls. Verse 15 of chapter 11 says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, it's being proclaimed as if it's a done deal. In other words, this is it, folks. This is... This is the Messiah coming to set up his kingdom, the Lord setting up his and, uh, and his Christ, the Lord and his Christ, and he's going to reign forever and ever. So it's a proclamation of what's about to come with the consummation of the bowls and the rest of the, the whole of the great tribulation. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. Now this is back into heaven, right? So we've kind of we're kind of getting to where Revelation chapter 12 is, where it starts off kind of in heaven. So now we're, we're, we're flashing up, we're looking upward, we're changing perspective now, the heavenly perspective. 24 elders, which represent who? The church, right? So they're saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. And the time of the dead, and they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. A lot of people tend to wonder about that, and they think, well, I know where the, the Ark of the Covenant is. It's in heaven. It's not hiding somewhere on earth or whatever. Well, what we have on earth is a picture of what God has in heaven. God has a temple in heaven, and the Ark of the Covenant that we have on the earth is modeled after this. It follows these specifications. They're, these are, are two different things that are going on here. So if this is the temple of God. It's not, uh, didn't come up from um, the temple that's still down there on the earth. Yeah. So God is getting ready. There were th lightnings, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. So all these things are coming upon the earth. And, and we're gonna, we're looking at this uh, setup to the, uh, the great tribulation. So with that, we'll, we'll wrap this up. We'll, go that. we'll call it good. And next time we will go into Revelation chapter 12 and we'll see the war in heaven. And we'll see some of the other players. We've seen some of the good guys this time. We've seen the temple. Now we're going to see the flip side of that next week with, with uh, chapter 12.